This video series will help you develop an effective and practical approach to brain MRI, courtesy of Dr. Bejman Marlani. Dr. Marlani is a world-class neuroradiologist, highly respected in Toronto and internationally. He's also one of the best teachers in the Toronto program. It feels like he wins the teaching award almost every single year. I still remember when he taught me his approach to brain MR back when I was a resident. It genuinely blew my mind, no pun intended. It made me into a better radiologist, and that is why I want to share this with all of you. Now, this is not your average radiology approach video. It's not meant to be a prescriptive checklist. In this first video, part one, we'll start with a very basic introduction to common sequences used in routine brain MRI, including what to use each of the sequences for. We'll cover diffusion-weighted imaging and ADC maps, T1-weighted imaging, standard T2-weighted imaging, T2 flare, gradient echo and susceptibility-weighted imaging, or SWY, and T1-weighted post-GAD imaging. In part two, we'll dive deeper into each sequence and get a bit more granular for radiologists. This second video is going to focus on key pearls that you won't find in a textbook, things that Dr. Marlani has learned from years of experience as an academic neuroradiologist, including common blind spots. For these videos, we are assuming some knowledge of basic anatomy, which is covered in our CT head video. Some basic understanding of MRI is also helpful, but not explicitly required. By the end of these videos, you'll have the tools that you need to start looking at cases, but most importantly, the single best way to learn radiology, especially for nuanced topics like brain MRI, is by seeing real-life cases. That is why we created the Brain MRI course on NavigatingRadiology.com. It features fully scrollable, real-world brain MRI cases designed to efficiently cover the core pathologies that every radiologist should recognize, including infarcts, trauma, infectious and inflammatory pathologies, toxic and metabolic disorders, vascular pathologies, epilepsy, and, of course, tumors. Each case can be taken as an unknown with AI-generated hints and feedback, and every case includes links to key findings, learning material, and video walkthroughs of the findings by Dr. Marlani himself. To access this case-based course, go to navigatingradiology.com. So without further ado, I'll hand things off to Dr. Bejma Marlani, who's going to start with a very basic intro to the key MRI sequences, and I'll be jumping in from time to time with some additional key points as well. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for paying attention to this lecture. We're going to review the basic sequences of MRI of the brain. What is going to be discussed here is a very basic introduction to common sequences used in conventional MRI of the brain. Depending on the indication, a conventional MRI of the brain may contain sequences such as diffusion-weighted imaging, sagittal or axial T1, axial T2, axial T2 flare, axial gradient echo, and if needed, post gadolinium T1 sequence. Let's take a closer look at what these sequences are. The first sequence we're going to discuss is diffusion-weighted imaging. This sequence is essentially part of every MRI of the brain. When you look at diffusion-weighted imaging on your PAC system, you usually see two series. The first one that looks like this one is called DWI or a similar name, and the other one is called ADC map. Let's look at them one by one. On DWI sequence, which is this one, there are at least two series included within this. This is the first one, which is called B1000, and this is the other one, which is called B0 map. The one we essentially look at is primarily the B1000. At minimum, you need we need two B values, commonly the B1000, B1000 and B0 to calculate the quantitative map that I showed you earlier, which is called ADC map. Let's take a look at it again. This is the ADC map. And ADC map is a quantitative map and, it's a, and it has values and the units are in millimeter square per second and it's automatically calculated by the scanner. What does this practically mean? For diseases that show restricted diffusion, such as acute infarct or hypercellular tumors like lymphoma, we usually see high signal on DWI, this sequence, and corresponding low signal on the ADC. That means there is restricted diffusion. If for a lesion there is increased signal on DWI, 
but there's also increased corresponding signal on ADC map. We refer this to T2 shine through or facilitated diffusion. Most of the time, DWI is the first sequence that is obtained by the technologist. And if there are any artifacts on this sequence, this is a good time to make corrective measures. For example, if for some reason there is a hair clip left causing artifact, the technologist can remove the hair clip and repeat the scan without other sequences being degraded by the artifact. The next sequence we are going to talk about is T1. And in particular, we talk about sagittal T1. This is a sagittal T1 weighted image. This may be obtained as a two-dimensional sagittally acquired sequence, such as this scan, or this may be obtained as a three-dimensional sequence in um, sagittal plane reformatted to other planes or in other planes acquired in axial plane reformatted to sagittal image. On T1 weighted images, the gray matter is gray and the white matter is white. Let's look at this, see, this is a white matter and this is a gray matter. The relatively, the gray matter is gray and the white matter is white. The other important point is on sagittal T1 weighted images, that CSF is hyposignal. The sagittal T1 is a great sequence to look at midline structures, such as whatever we see from the cervical spine and cervical cord, cervical medullary junction, brain stem including medulla, pons, and midbrain, and tectal plate, and also cerebellar vermis, mammillary body, hypothalamus, pituitary infundibulum, optic chiasm, corpus callosum, and also the fornices. I'm gonna show you this one one more time. This is a volumetric T1, and let's look at, look at those structures again in a different patient. This is a cervical spine. This is a cervical cord, cervical medullary junction, medulla, pons, midbrain. This is a tectile plate. This is the mammillary body. This is the hypothalamus. This is pituitary infundibulum. This is optic chiasm. This is corpus callosum, and this is the fornix. Depending on the protocol, we may also have axial or coronal T1 weighted images in, in our scan as well. The next sequence is axial T2. And this is how an axial T2 weighted image looks like. As we can see, this is a great view of the ventricles and sulci and essentially all the CSF spaces. The axial T2 weighted image also provides a great opportunity to assess the interface of a mass with CSF. For example, if we are trying to determine if a mass is intraaxial or extraaxial, the presence of a CSF cleft will be a useful feature for an extraaxial mass. A lot of disorders such as tumor infection and inflammatory disorders cause vasogenic edema in the brain, and that shows as areas of T2 hypersignal within the brain. Another important point we need to assess on axial or any other T2 weighted images are the flow voids. Flow voids refer to major vessels such as basal or artery, internal carotid arteries, or middle cerebral arteries. As there is flowing blood within these structures, the flowing blood moves out of the excitation slab at the time of radio frequency pulse and therefore do not contribute any signal, meaning they appear signal void or completely black. On T2 weighted images, if we see any signal within these structures, we need to find a reason for that, such as thrombosis or clot. The T2 weighted images are also great to look at the orbits, paranasal sinuses, and the mastoid aerosols. The next sequence we're going to discuss is axial T2 flare. As the name implies, this is a T2 weighted image with an inversion recovery pulse applied to null the CSF signal, and therefore CSF is hyposignal. The main advantage of this sequence is that the edema in the brain parenchyma is more conspicuous as the bright signal from CSF has been nulled. As I mentioned earlier, many of the abnormalities in the brain demonstrate some sort of hypersignal on T2 or T2 flare sequence. In addition, on T2 flare sequence, we can look at the sulci, not that the signal from the CSF has been nulled, we can look for abnormalities within the sulci. For example, if we see hypersignal in T2 flare 
sequence in the cell side, we can think about subarachnoid hemorrhage or presence of infection or inflammation within the CSF. Sometimes in some patients, particularly ventilated patients, in whom the fraction of inspired oxygen or FiO2 is high, these patients may also demonstrate characteristic flare hypersignal in the cell side. If your particular MRI protocol does not have dedicated T2-weighted images, the, ax the axial or any other flare sequence that we have obtained, it is a great opportunity to check the flow voids. See, these are the flow voids of internal carotid arteries. This is a basilar artery. And the flow void of the medial cerebral arteries are here embedded in the CSF. That's also hyposignal. We sh essentially, we shouldn't see any hypersignal within these structures that are, that are supposed to appear dark on T2 flare. The next sequence we are going to show you on the standard brain MRI is called gradient echo. Basically, what this sequence shows is that the area of hemorrhage or calcification show blooming, meaning they show marked hyposignal that are larger than the actual lesion. The grain echo sequence can be used to detect small areas of hemorrhage within an infarct bed or in the tumor. It can also show small traumatic bleeds in patients who had head trauma. It can also show microbleeds in patients that has implications in neurodegenerative or neurovascular disorders. Sometimes we may see a sequence called susceptibility weighted imaging. Essentially, this is also a gradient echo sequence, but it has a lot of other uh, amazing characteristics, which is outside the scope of this basic uh, lecture. But again, we look for areas of susceptibility. For example, this is a cerebral, this is a microbleed in the cerebellum, or this is an area of old hemorrhage. And see what we, I mean by blooming, the actual size of this hemorrhage is this is an old hemorrhage is smaller and the blooming artifact makes it look bigger. And the last sequence we're going to discuss is T1 post-contrast image. I'm gonna put a T1 pre-contrast here and then a T1 post-contrast here. This may also be acquired as a two-dimensional sequence or a high-resolution three-dimensional sequence like this one with multi-planar reformats or both. The principal idea is many pathologic processes such as tumor, infection, or inflammation cause break in blood-brain barrier and therefore gadolinium-based contrast agents leak outside of the vessels. As gadolinium causes T1 shortening, this translates to T1 hypersignal. Practically what it means, we put the T1 pre and post contrast images side by side. And if we see there is an area that shows increased T1 signal from pre to post contrast image, that means there is enhancement. Depending on the protocol that we're using, the vessels may or may not demonstrate T1 hypersignal on post gadolinium scan. For example, in this scan, the vessels are hypersignal, but they may not necessarily be hypersignal depending on the protocol. As Dr. Marlani introduced, the key principle is that breakdown of the blood-brain barrier leads to abnormal parenchymal enhancement that you will see with tumors, infection, inflammation, etc. But there are also a number of areas in the brain that normally enhance because they don't have a blood-brain barrier. These are not abnormal, and of course, it's important to know what they are. The most important to know include the cord plexus, the pituitary gland, and pineal gland. These are easy to remember because they're both midline structures that start with P, and smaller structures that are beyond the scope here. As an aside, parts of the dura enhance, but are normally very thin and difficult to see on routine imaging. Dural reflections may also look brighter, but much of that is actually vascular rather than meningeal enhancement. Again, these are normal. Abnormal parenchymal enhancement can be caused by various conditions, and a key basic concept is characterizing the patterns of abnormal enhancement and associated differentials. This is something that we cover in greater depth in our case-based course, but let's briefly introduce the most important here, starting from the outside and then working inwards. First and most peripheral, there are two types of abnormal meningeal enhancement. We have number one, pachy meningeal enhancement, referring to enhancement of the dura, 
Remember the dura is the outer layer of the meninges that surrounds the central nervous system, closely applied to the inner skull. So you can get dural enhancement that is too much or too thick with dural edema in conditions like intracranial hypotension, neoplasms like meningiomas with dural tails, granulomatous diseases like TB and sarcoid that often involve thick basal dural enhancement, and post-intervention, i.e. post-op. Number two, leptomeningeal enhancement, which refers to enhancement along the surface of the brain, i.e. the pia arachnoid. This will follow the contours of the sulci, with the two most important things to consider being infectious meningitis, the primary consideration, and tumor, i.e. leptomeningeal carcinomatosis due to spread of tumor, amongst other entities that we're going to talk about in the course. Number three is gyriform enhancement. This is enhancement in the brain parenchyma along the cortical slash gyral surface. You may see this in a handful of specific entities, but by far the most common is subacute infarct, so that's the one you should remember. Others include HSV encephalitis, though it's not the main feature, and PRESS, though not characteristic. Again, for now, know the pattern of enhancement and that it's most commonly seen with subacute infarct. And again, we're just introducing these ideas. We'll show you examples of these in the course and the associated differentials. Number four, ring enhancement in the brain itself. So there's a long and classic differential here that is beyond the scope of this introductory video, but we cover these pathologies in our course. The most common and important to remember for now are tumor, including metastases and high-grade gliomas, abscess, and demyelination, which most commonly has an incomplete ring of enhancement and little to no mass effect, which helps differentiate it from tumor. There are others here on the list as well, i.e. post-radiation, contusion, infarct, etc., and we'll get into more detail in the course. And number five, periventricular enhancement, which refers to enhancement of the subependymal surface around the ventricles. The differential includes infectious ependymitis or ventriculitis post-abscess rupture, tumors that may spread here, and inflammatory conditions like MS, though usually not enhancing. Okay, so that just about does it for part one of this video. In part two, Dr. Marlani will guide us through a more in-depth look at each sequence with a focus on common blind spots and introductory pearls that you won't find in a textbook. Lastly, and most importantly, our case-based course on navigatingradiology.com covers the essentials of brain MR through unknown cases with AI feedback and learning material. The case list is curated to cover the most important topics, including infarcts, trauma, infectious and inflammatory conditions, toxic and metabolic disorders, vascular pathologies, epilepsy, and of course, tumors. Thank you again to Dr. Pejman Marlani, and thank you for your attention. See you next time.